Well, I'm, I'm delighted to say that joining me on the Godcast today is uh, Mike McLean, who is uh, known for his comedy, for his writing, for his uh, TV uh, presenting, uh, a, a, a man of many skills, uh, a Manchester lad. Mike, it's brilliant to get you on the Godcast. How are you doing? Thank you very much indeed. Lovely to be on, Alex. Are you, are you still Manchester-based, Mike, or has fame and no. fortune took you to sorry stop belt? Or yeah, no, I left in uh, I think nineteen ninety five. I was doing the summer season in Scarborough, and I got a call from a, a channel called Nickelodeon, and uh, I went down there. And it was only what was supposed to be for three months. It was initially a three month contract. I'd auditioned for them before, and I didn't get anything. And then um, the guy that was uh, didn't like me had left, so so. Uh, he didn't like me because I was funny and he wanted to be funny. So he sort of went and then the producer said, look, we'll get you in. And they got me in. It was only for three months. So I was traveling between Scarborough. So I was doing my stand up in the evening, getting up in the morning at half five, getting a six o'clock train from York into London, doing the telly and then back to doing stand up. So I did that for about six weeks before they said, look, you know, we'll give you a contract. I, I didn't realise you did the old summer season, Mike. Just tell us a bit about that. Who were you? Were you supporting, or were you uh, were you headlining at that point? There, no, definitely wasn't headlining. I was uh, I was learning my trade. The first season I did was at a place called Wincup's Holiday Park in North Wales, and um, I did that. And on the bill there was Ken Dodd, and uh, you did two slots. You did like a Wednesday and a Friday, and I used to die on my backside on a Wednesday and do okay on a Friday. But you were never allowed to go over a certain amount of time, you know, 15 minutes, and that was it. A bit different to Doddy then. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he, there was a great joke, and I, I don't know who wrote it, it was a very good joke. They reckon that if he'd have got done for that tax evasion, uh, he'd have got about 15 years, but knowing Doddy, he'd have done about 30. <laughs> That's a good gag. A yeah. great gag. Who came up with it. it was a very good gag. Um, no, the summer season was just a learning. It was a brilliant learning curve. I don't, I don't know if they're around today. Um, and back then, it was the way you sort of went on stage, and you had to host competitions. You know, like the disco dancing competitions or the glamorous granny. So you sort of you did learn your trade. You learned your trade brilliant how to handle people, how to be funny, and you know you're doing that. I think six nights a week. Yeah, six nights a week. So it was it was it was really really hard. What was the what was the greater education, Mike? Doing the doing the holiday camps or working with Ken Dodd? Bit of both, really. He did. He'd give you advice. Um, I'd work with a lot of comics and watch comics. You know, there was a great guy called Chris Clayton who was an Elvis impersonator, and he was fantastic. The way he worked the stage, the way he got the audience going. You know, he was just very good. And Doddy was good. He he had the art of. Um, he, he always said he had his big arms open and he just, like a shepherd, just herded them in, herded them in. And when they were in, shut the gate and wouldn't let them out, you know. It was just a great to watch a master at work. Even even bad comics, you know, there were bad comics that come on and you learn. And, you know, every Wednesday I was petrified at half past seven going on. In fact, Wednesday, the half seven till eight, and I was just petrified because I was doing jokes at the time about my wife and here I was at 20 or 20, what? no, I wasn't, so 18, 19. I'm doing jokes about my wife. I wasn't even married, you know. Mm. Um, and even down to the dinner suit, you know, he said, don't wear a dinner suit. I was like, what? He said, you don't wear a dinner suit. You're 18, 19. You, don't, you wouldn't wear a dinner suit. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. It was just little things like that, you know. Were you, were you always destined to be a comic, Mike? Were you like the class clown and stuff? Well, I'd gone for Prime Minister of Great Britain, uh, but apparently need qualifications. <laughs> yeah, I was. I went to St. Albans RCI School in, in Gorton, and um, I just loved comedy. You know, I loved watching with my dad. I loved my little lad's called Cooper, named after my favourite comedian, Tommy Cooper. And um, I just loved comedy. I, I loved, you know, on radio, I think it was on Radio 1 on a Saturday, they used to have like a comedy bit. You know, I used to record it and then write down all the gags. and Yeah. And I, file of gags and I'd watch every comic on the telly. I just, and I like the science behind comedy that, you know, and back then when I did comedy, I was quite aggressive. I was a real Northern comic, you know, Yeah. until a director called John Spillers, who was a great panto director, said you need to slow down and be less aggressive. Do, do you, are you able to watch, I mean, I, I mean, I'm not a comic, I had a go at it and, and, um, it was all right, but but not to the level that you got to, that you're at. But 
Do, do you find it easy to um, sit a comedian and watch them for entertainment, Mike, or or do you find that you're studying uh, the craft of what they're doing most of the time? No, I sit down and enjoy them. I, 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 I love comedy. You know, even like I'm on the weekend with two or three other comics and I'll sit down and I love watching them. I love watching, I like watching new comics come through, you know, um, and I like watching bad comics. I particularly like watching bad comics because they're funny for the wrong reasons, you know. I always wanted to write a series called Bad Comics, and it was just literally a series of bad comedians because it'll just be brilliant, you know. But yeah, no, I, I do. I, I go away and um, and I watch them and I enjoy them. I like all forms of entertainment, even on the cruise ships. Now I'll I'll sit and watch them. I, mean, I may not watch the whole show, but I might think, all right, I'll give them ten minutes and I enjoy them. And you know, I just come back from Hawaii with a, a great comic American guy called Mike Siegel. It was brilliant, really good. You know, I liked the way he worked. He was very slow. You know, he, he was he was very um, engaging, you know, and he had some lovely throwaway lines, you know. And it's funny, really, because when you sit down with another comic, either some will either give you notes or suggest stuff. Like, I was on a ship with Tom Holland, Dominic, uh, uh, Dominic Holland, which is Tom Holland's dad, you know, Spider-Man. Mm. And he said, do you like notes? And I said, yeah, yeah. And he said, look, if you do this there, I'll say that there, I'll do that. He's still learning, you know. I remember John Spillers, uh, sorry, John Pertwin in my first ever panto. He kept picking on me, and I thought he was picking on me. He was saying, do this, do this. And I was like, he's kind of on my nerves. And there's a great actor called Simon Gregson. I shared a dressing room with him. I was like, oh, he's, he's getting right on my nerves. He said, Mike, have you noticed that John just gravitates towards you? And I was like, I don't know why. He said, because he likes you. He's, he's, only, he's, he's giving you notes, you know, and, and he's giving nobody else notes. Yeah. And John Pertry said, look, the, the only thing in life is free that is advice and only an idiot wouldn't take advice, you know. And I probably learned more from those six weeks in my first ever panto with him than I did at any drama school. Yeah. And and do you, do you feel like um, even if uh, you've got a bit of a dry audience, Mike, your experience and your kind of uh, skills just can pull an audience around? I was I was chatting to a comedian called Andy Kinder. I don't know if you know him. Um, a funny guy, and and he and he's been a pro stand up for years, and he's never been on the telly. But he just said, "I feel like I've honed my craft, and you know, and if it's not going so well, I feel I can I can spin it round." You know, are you the same? Yeah, you can. You can, you know, you can either go one way with comedy, or they might not like it, and you think, "All oh, right, okay, they like it. clever." I don't do clever humor. I don't do political stuff. I certainly don't do religious stuff. It's just funny. I'm just I, that's what I do. But sometimes you, no matter what, I, there's a there's a gig in in near me at South End, and um, and I did it. And the first time I did it, I just died on my backside. Even now, you know. So I thought, right, I'm gonna go again. You know. So when the listing came up, I put my name forward. And I was like, you know what, I'll do that again. So I did it again, and it still wasn't, you know. And about three months ago, yeah, it was three months ago. I said, right, I'll, I'll put me in it. It came up again, and I went, I'm going to do it again, because I just had this thing to crack it. Mm. I just, and I couldn't, you know. So sometimes, I remember Jimmy Carr saying to me once, it's, he did a gig once, and he came off stage, and he didn't do great. And he went, it's not me, it's them. Just like that, you know. And he said, it's, it's not me, my stuff's great. It's it's them, they're thick. So you can do it. Some places you can, like some other places you just, you know, you can't, you just, you know, it, it can be anything down to the weather. You know, if you do a gig at the end of the month, it's always great because they've just been paid. You know, it, it's really weird. It's, it's, it, there's so many little things that you've got to think about. Yeah. And in terms, and in terms of your stuff, Mike, is that always evolving? You know, is it, is it, you know, I mean, I'm not going to say which comedian, but there's a comedian I do like, but, I go. I've seen him numerous times, and you know, quite often he'll he'll draw out the old stuff. I think I'll wear this again. He's still funny, but you know, it's like, come on, I, I want something fresh now. How do you, how, how do you work it? Yeah, you have your act. You have like it's like an ingredient, isn't it? It's like baking a cake. You have the, the ingredients, but you can always add to that, you know. And and comics always fall back on their safety net if it's not working. They go, All right, I'll pull up. I always every day, every day I'm on the dictaphone and I'm I think of something and I'll I'll put it in my uh, in my phone and then I'll go away and like you know I just like they're all written down and then I then have to sit down 
and then go through them and then, you know, and I say to my girlfriend, like, I've got this gag, what do you think of this gag, you know? Like, even today, I was like, I said, um, it was yesterday, sorry, I was on the train with my son and found some lottery tickets. They'd been done, you know? And the gag I came up with is like, my brother's just won the lottery and bought a £1.5 million pound house. I don't know who's going to pay for it. He only got three numbers. And it was just, it's just stuff like that that I put in front of go, right, that's a gag, you know, and I keep... So then I'll use it and I'll, I've got this thing where I try them out three or four times and see what the response is, you know. And if it's good and it gets laughs, I keep it. And if it doesn't, I file it under B1N. <laughs> got it. <laughs> it took a minute. <laughs> I know. I get <laughs> I gave you the minute. I could see the I could see the thought process going in the head. I'm so surprised it took me that it was that quick actually. <laughs> it shot me but, as well. So listen, Mike, a lot a lot of folk think, don't they, that you know, if you've been on telly and and um, you disappear, that's it, career over. Um, yeah. um uh, there's a couple of things in there is I know your career's not over because I, I I I follow comics, it's my passion. But yeah. I was wondering what you thought about uh, telly and comedy at the moment there seems to be there seems to be like a pool of comics doesn't there that they kind of are on a bit of a revolving wheel i mean yeah i mean i've nothing against tom allen but he's on everything at the minute and and uh I, I, i'm sure his accountant's delighted but there seems to be not much room for uh uh new guys and girls um and uh established acts like yourself do, do you does that disappoint you in any way or it's not valid. I tell you what it is. It's lazy producing. These producers don't get off the backsides and go out to comedy clubs, and they won't go further than the they won't go further than Watford to go and watch other comics. And they'll what they'll do is a there's the comic mafia, there is the agency in London that have got all the big name comics, and they use them all the time. And then there's producers that just can't be bothered and just lazy and just go right. Let's get Tom Allen or let's get Jimmy Carroll. Let's get you know because they're there and we can. And I, I have this really be in my bonnet because I work with so... I've been lucky. I've had a really good chunk of TV life. You know, I've been very fortunate, bought a lovely house out of it and I've had a great time out of it. And I still do the bit. I mean, I was on GMTV the other morning and still do little bits and it's great. And I feel for those comics that haven't had it. I, I write with a great comic called Jerry Kay, who's my writing partner. That guy's brilliant. He's just funny, funny, funny. He writes for me and we write together. And we gig together, and he's never had that bit on the table, which I think he should have because he's funny. You know, uh, there's other comics that I've worked with that are funny. You know, but they just don't get that that little bit of what's the word I'm looking for? They don't get that chance, that opportunity. You know, so nowadays the only opportunity now is is Britain's Got Talent, and I wouldn't recommend that to anybody. If if I'm really honest, you know, it's a lot. It's a gamble that because it can either make or break your career. Yeah, I did. Uh, I did Britain's Got Talent, and and uh, we a comedy. We did a bit of comedy, but uh, I mean, we were doing it for a laugh, you know. But you did see some people, and I do. I agree with you. Some people set their whole life on on succeeding yeah. there or not succeeding, don't they? And and they and they're kind of fly by nights, and you never see them again. And I think that's quite sad, but. Just in the whole, you know, the. I mean, I think there's some good sitcoms knocking around, but in terms of comedy, you know, I think it needs an injection of something else. But, but there we go. Just, and we're, just, also in a, we're also in a time now where comics have got to be careful what they say and what they do. And I just watched Ricky Gervais's new, um, new comedy because I worked with him on The Office, and I just thought he was brilliant. I just thought I loved the fact that he didn't care. He just went out, and you know. And I've watched some interviews of him about people going, "Oh, that's rude." He's like, "No, comedy subjective, you know." Yeah. And, and yeah, we've got. I, I, I agree, Mike. I mean, I, I mean, obviously, I'm a, I'm a, a, a not obvious. Well, if, if you're watching it, it's obviously I'm a vicar, and the podcast is called the Godcast. But I, I do think that some some people get really uptight about comedy, and uh, you know, uh, I, I don't. I, I don't find I've never found comedy offensive, even if it's been kind of. Um, Headlined, you know, yeah. if easily offended, stay away. And 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 um, I find that real, really, really, really difficult to, you know. But I'm I'm interested to know, Mike, how you set that in your work. Do, do you kind of have look? This is what I do, and some people are going to like it. You know, do you, do you set a boundary for yourself or not? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's certain subjects I don't touch and I don't approach because that's not my style, you know. And then, yeah, I I. I I did a gag 
And uh, I remember this woman coming to me and saying, oh, I really enjoyed yourself, but I didn't like quite like that gag you should take out. Now, normally you'd go, yeah, all right. And my mate was like, why did you give her the time of day? And I said to her, look, there's 300 people in here tonight. And the only person that found that last gag offensive was you. So I'm not going to go to another gig. And if I take it out, then that gag isn't going to make 300 people laugh. You know, so I've taken it out just to keep you happy. And so I'm not going to do that because I'm going to go with the odds of doing it again and making another 300 people happy. She goes, well, what happens if that one person doesn't like it? I said, well, I'll give them your number. You two can get together and discuss it because I'm, you know, just going to leave it in, you know. Yeah. Listen, if you don't like horror movies, you don't watch horror films. No. Do you know what I mean? I do, yeah. And and these people, I I just think nowadays, this generation is so quick to complain and, oh, and I'm like, oh, you know, it's just, and I always say at the end, it's just, it's just, it's just a gag. It's just, nobody's died. It's just a gag. No. And if I did anybody, I couldn't care less. I don't know if you ever worked with Duncan Novell, Mike, but Duncan came on and, and, uh, he told me about a joke he'd written and he didn't know whether it was offensive and it was that he, he his local Chinese buffy does a 24-hour eat-all-you-can buffy and says the problem is they only give you one chopstick. And, I, you know, I think that's yeah. funny. Yeah, great guy, yeah. yeah. It's, it's not in any way offensive. But he was, like, worried, you know, and he's and he's a guy who's been in the game for donkey's years, you know, so yeah. it just shows you how, how, how difficult it is, doesn't it? I just think do it, you know, just just do it. I remember doing a gig once and um Bobby Davro was said to me, Why did you why did you go soft on him? I was like, he said, You should never change. Just just do what you do, you know, and just say what you say and, and, and if they don't like it, they don't like it. And they go, away. you get in your car, you still get paid. You go home. He said, But don't ever change because and he was absolutely right. He, he, I and I'd say that to any comic nowadays, if you know, they go, Oh, is this offensive? Just do it. And if they don't like it, they don't like it. Yeah, Mike. Sure just talk, just talking about the telly days and and uh, the the big breakfast. I, I just googled it this morning, and and what pops up is you uh, you at the uh, awards of the uh, all these rock stars and all these kind of weirdos. I mean, you've you've interviewed some some quite extraordinary people in your time, haven't you? Is there any who kind of it left a mark on you, and you thought, yeah, I like that guy, or you know, or or the complete opposite. Uh, I did Ocean's Eleven with Brad Pitt. Uh, it was all the cast of Ocean's Eleven, and every one of them was fantastic. And the ones I've always found, the bigger the star, the, the nicer. They are. I remember flirting with Julia Roberts in New York. You just, you know, uh, and the only one I didn't quite was um, the late Dennis Waterman. He was, he was in My Fair, My Fair Lady, and we'd gone to London to interview him, and he he was just, and he was just so rude, so rude, you know. And I let him have both barrels because the beauty of coming from Manchester is you tell people exactly what you think, you know. And back then, I just didn't care. I just thought, yeah. no. And I told him straight. Uh, I think it, I think he even made the papers or something. I think he tried to grab me. That was it. He tried to grab me. And bless Dale Winton, the late, great Dale Winton, sort of stood in and, you know. But he was, he was really rude. And I just thought, oh, you know. Um, they say never meet your heroes. And I was disappointed with Steve Coogan because I... A big Steve Coogan fan, and, and I didn't. I'm sort of disappointed when I met him, you know. Mm. But the, the big A listers and everybody, you know, they're all fantastic. They're all really nice. And I, I just had a cheeky way. I was never rude. I was just always cheeky. You had and a glint in your eye, Mike, didn't yeah. you? You had. You were. You were great. Yeah, I just pulled. I'd always smile at him as I, as I sort of. I remember we used to do this gag at a premiere where whoever the first celebrity was. I'd, I'd go, congratulations, you're the first celebrity here tonight. And he'd go, thank you. And I'd go, that's it. And that was it. And that was, you know, that was the, that was the running gag that we did on the breakfast. And he got known, you know, so much so that I, I was told that certain celebrities didn't want to go in unless they were like the second or the third in. <laughs> what John was it John, like? Go on, right. Let me interview him. Hey, say again. John, let me interview him. All oh, right, okay. Because his PR had seen what I'd done, and 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 because I started to get a name, you know, on 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 the and the and the carpets and stuff like that. So he didn't want to be interviewed by me. So yeah, that was that was that was nice. Yeah, and when and when the telly stuff dried up a bit, Mike was was that um, was that difficult for you? Was it uh, you know you know the 
careers are often of uh, troughs and peaks, aren't they? And but did yeah. you just kind of battle on, or were you a bit demoralised? Yeah. Listen, everything has a shelf life, and I'm no different to anybody else. You know, I I lost all my hair when it's funny, really, because as soon as my hair hair went, you know, um, and I went and I did years with Rich and Judy. I worked on there. In fact, I only saw Richard the other morning at GMTV. Um, and I did seven years on there. My little lad had been born, and I just got offered the XFM breakfast in Manford, which I did for a year. And then my other little lad, uh, my ex-wife, was was pregnant with my second child. And I decided then, just to, for that year, just to do nothing. I did, I did a year. I, I was fortunate. I was very fortunate to be in a nice position where I didn't have a mortgage or anything like that. I wasn't stupid with my money. I invested it wisely. I looked after my mum and dad, made sure they were house paid off in Levin Uh And I looked after myself and bought a nice property and it was all taken care of. So we were in a nice position. And then, so I made sure that that year I spent with the kids and I took them to school and I come and people were like, oh, you know, I did little bits and bobs, you know, I didn't, didn't do nothing and it was just it was just nice it was really nice and after the telly um it's funny really because you go back to doing stand-up and you'll do a gig like for i don't know three four hundred quid and people are like what are you doing here you you know you i was like well i've still got two kids to feed and i've got you know electricity and gas to pay mm. and i just liked being on the road and there was it was i missed the camaraderie of like the big breakfast was one of the best gigs i've ever had nick Lode in big breakfast with richard judy but I was fortunate to do other little bits. Like I did episode of Shameless, My Big Fat Diary. I did the Office Christmas Special Ricky your face. So I was still in and about. And I was still getting offered stuff, but stuff that I didn't want to do. There was there was a lot of channels starting then, and they were doing these really bad programmes. And I just thought, no. The biggest regret was I got offered the very first time a celebrity get me out of it, and I turned it down. Really? Oh, dear. Because I didn't want to do a reality show. And I got offered that. And I got offered, like... Uh, big brother a couple of times but I just thought no I just couldn't the thought of being in a house with a load of these celebrities I, I did the match on Sky One which I loved it was about football it was a team of celebrities we lived at Newcastle and it was great but everybody was sort of fighting for for the, the air time you know on the face mm -hmm. and yeah. I wasn't I never did it to be famous Alex. I did it because I really enjoyed what I did yeah you know I'm stu I loved getting up in the morning when I did Nickelodeon doing the breakfast show I loved getting up and doing the big breakfast. I loved traveling the country. I loved meeting people. And, you know, I, I had a great, great time. Right? Yeah. And what about Panto, Mike? Does that, is, do you love that? Oh, it's one of my favorite times of year. I love it. I very, when I did my first Panto, uh, like I said to you, with, with John Pertry. And after that, I wasn't the lead comic. I was sort of like second or third comic, you know. And then there's that ladder to climb to get to become you know and then i did one uh ilford where it was the lead comic and it was only like 400 seat a venue and i loved it and then the second year they asked me back and i did it again and then this great director called john spillers who's no longer with us um is with your boss actually um he he was just such a great mentor so so good as a director and and i did like seven or eight years with him and then he, he, I just learned so much, you know, every year we'd get together and he'd go, right, what about this? And i go, what about this? And what about that? And and he was just brilliant. And he'd say, no, you're doing that wrong. You need to hold that for a second or you need to do that, you know, or he'd tell me off for messing about on stage. So it was, it, yeah, Panto's great. And now I direct and I write and I, I love that. Yeah, yeah. I um, just think about what you said there about uh, being with me, with my boss, you know. So do you... um. Do you, do you see your talent as a gift, Mike? Do you, you know, I'm chatting, uh, a mate of mine is Jimmy Cricket, who's, who's, who's son's, oh, a, who's son's yeah. a priest. And, you know, and I've had a few other, uh, Tommy Cannon came on, who's, who's a religious uh, guy. Do, 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 you, do you think your what you have is is a gift that's been given to you? That's a brilliant question, Alex, and one that I, I, I can only answer when I see your boss and say, did you, I just feel as if, when I was being made, I felt like he 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 put on the arms, he put the legs, and then it even came to the brains. He went, oh, we ran out, we've run out of really good, clever brains. But we've got what's this box? Funny bones. Give him some of them. Give him some of them. And and I think yeah, I, I mm, it's a that's a brilliant question. I just you know, I think yeah, everything's a gift, isn't it? But it's a gift. I've been giving it, but I've still had to work at it to make it a really good gift. Yeah. 
that makes but, sense. You know, I, I you know I think about this. I mean, I'm I, I, I'm not claiming to be funny, but I think some people just say I've got one a funny face. And but but I think people like you, you know, particularly through like COVID and stuff, you will have you will have made a big difference to people's lives because you've got the gift of of, of laughter in you. And, and uh, I think the value of that has been undervalued, I think, in the recovery from from the the pandemic because, oh, my God, I've been through some tough times with work-related stuff, and you think, well, I'm so grateful that I've got a sense of humour because otherwise I could have just crumbled. And, you know, and I think that applies to people like you as well. Yeah, during COVID, it was funny, really, because um, Joe Wicks was on the telly and doing all these videos, you know. And uh, I said to my my, uh, my partner, Kay, I said, I'm going to do something. And I made, I made literally six, and they're on my Facebook, so I don't know if you're, if, if you be a member of Facebook, or I don't know if you are, but if you are, tag me in. And I made these short little videos, and they're no longer than a minute, Alex, and I'm, and I put them on then. It was about keeping fit. And it was a, it was a Mickey taker, Joe Wicks. Well, I put them on there. And the amount of people that were like, oh, my God. And I'd say, they're like, how many? When's the next one? And I was like, tomorrow, you know. And then and you know, when I stopped doing them, people were like, you've got to do more. You've got to do more. You, And I just thought, no. Lee, there's that great mm-hmm. saying, they wanting more. Mm-hmm. And, I, and they were just completely, they were self-deprecating. They were all about you know, they're keeping fit and they were just, you know, and I, I didn't realise at the time I did them, you know, and then my girlfriend the other day said to me, look, and they came up on her Facebook and she went, look at that. And I watched them. And I made myself laugh. Like, you know, we were laughing, both laughing, watching us. And she said, they're really funny. Why don't you do some more? I was like, I don't know. I just didn't. Yeah. Just, my little lad now, he's sort of taking the mantra of being funny now. <laughs> Well, yeah, I know. I've I have a daughter a bit like that, actually. Just nice. just touching on on the on. I don't want to go delve into your private life, Mike, but um, you know, I've um, I, I never expect it to happen, but but I I've, I've been on radio and, and a bit of telly with, with a book I published last year, and and uh, it, it you know it gives you quite a bit of attention. But but my kids are just like yeah, whatever, you know. Um, yeah, whatever, Dad. How, how are your kids about you being, you know, kind of a, being a being in show business? Uh, do they do they do they ever let you know how proud they are, or do they just like Dad just get on with it? Only when they, it's funny, really, because they t- they do a they do a thing at school. You know, we have to take a book in. So they each took my biography because I wrote my autobiography, and they took it in, and then their teachers are like, "Oh, who's hold on a minute? Is that your dad?" And they're like, "Yeah." And then suddenly it's their friends' parents that know who I am and they know, you know. And they're like, yeah. And they're like, oh, is your dad Mike McClinton? And they're like, yeah. And to the point of, I took my lad for a casting yesterday for an advert. And uh, and it's funny because when we come back, he went, Dad, um, I had your book in my bag, you know. And the teacher was like, he went, is that your dad? And I was like, uh, he went, yeah. He was like, is it really your dad? He was like, yeah, look. And he's shown a picture of him in the book. And he was like, no way! I used to watch him on the big break, and and to they just laugh at it. They just go, yeah, all right, you know. Yeah. And like this Christmas, my little lad was in panto with me. It was Peter Pan, and he played the part of John, and he he loved the attention. He absolutely loved him. So when the panto finishes, I do a stand up gig on my own, you know. And uh, I said, do you want to do five minutes? He said, yeah, can I? So I wrote a little bit out for him. And he did it in front of 800 people. He did this set, you know, and he did really well. He did really well. But at the end, somebody came out and we came out with people waiting for photographs and, you know, not many as there was, but a few autographs and that. And then one of them went, oh, you were in a pant And he went, yeah, he said, can I have a photograph? My little lad's just there going. <laughs> <laughs> Bro. It's <Yeah>. nice, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. they, they, they know because of YouTube and, and, people, and things on Twitter and stuff like that, people go, you know, they, they you know, they don't really care. They just thought, oh, dad was, you know, used to be famous in the day. And I, we, were, we were in yesterday, London, we went for this casting and we went down Rathbone Place where the old Nickelodeon studios were being. I said to him, come on, I'll, I'll show you. And I said, look, this is where I used to get my coffee in the morning. And right there was where the studios, and he was like, can we go home now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I've got quite a good list. They've thought they've been on the Godcast, but the kid's just like, whatever, whatever, you know, and it's like, well, fair enough. So now, listen, we haven't, we haven't got long, but I want to touch on football because uh, I'm a I've got my Burnley shirt under here. I'm, I'm actually that, on, got my Burnley that, shirt under there. 
And we've got we've got your next manager, haven't we? And um, I suppose the question I've got in, in terms of City, are they going to do the treble? I think you'd, you'd be probably in a better position to answer that than me, Alex. Um, I'd like to say yes. I think it's a very difficult thing to do. And made up for you, by the way, I think um, we went to Burnley because Nick Pope used to play, was your goalkeeper. Mm. Who, he's married to Kevin Harlock, who's a good mate of mine. He used to play for oh, City. Right, okay. So when Cooper's birthday was, he sorted out some tickets to go and watch Burnley and Man City. So we went to Burnley. We had a lovely time. Um, I hope they do. I, I, I'd love them to do, Alex. I really, really would. Uh, I was saying to my eldest lad, who's they're both good. My eldest lad's been at they've both been at Ipswich Academy, and he's at uh, Billy Ricky now, the academy there. And we talk football all the time, you know. And we were saying, Lundy was saying this morning about how he hoped that Spurs don't. I hope Vincent Company doesn't go to Spurs because he's done so well with Burnley. I think the next the next challenge for him is to go into the Premiership with Burnley and see how he can how he can do, you know. Mm. And I think you'll do. I think you do well. I'd love City to do the treble. I love City to do the treble. Uh, yeah, definitely. I, I, if they're going to do it, I don't know. They, we're, we're on the way because they've just beat Bayern Munich the other night. Then we've got over one wall. If we beat them at, at their place, we're over one wall. Then we've got another wall to climb, and that's Real Madrid. So that's not going to be yeah. easy. I went to the Etihad for the cup match where we got we got well, we did all right for thirty minutes and then got murdered. I, got, I took a lot of comfort that a lot of teams have been murdered since then as well because I, I thought, oh my god, are we re- are we ready? You know, and uh, I think you are. I think we are ready. I think, and I think Vincent will stay as well because he's got he's got total control at the club and he's got young lads all uh, under twenty one internationals, and, and it's, 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 there's a there's an sense of excitement which you haven't got at Spurs at the minute, you know, and. Oh. I hope he stays up, stays with us. And he's he's in north, he's in the north as well, and he I think he's yeah. lives around Manchester. So I was at that game. I was at that game, and I thought for the first thirty minutes you played some great football. Really, he'd set you up. It was it's just that that little bit of skill and that little bit of you know. And I'm sure if he spends gets a little bit of money and and, and recruits right, I think you'll be uh, you'll be all right next year. Yeah. It's been great, get, great meeting you, Mike, and chatting to you. What's what's the year old? Have you got a lot on? I've just written. I've two things I've written. I've just written a, a series called Grassroots with Jerry Kane, and it's about a fictitious football club. And um, the manager's got done under a, a bung scandal, and he gets in touch with an agent who wants Jack Maguire, Maguire from League of Walsall, who's a genuine manager, but the agent mishears him and gets in Jack Marshall from uh, Walsall. So he has to go into this club, a bit like Man City, and and manage it. So we've just, we're literally, we've got a big name that is reading it, and I can't, we can't settle them, unfortunately, because mm. not a yes or no, but he's he's a big name, he's reading it, and he likes it. So if that gets off the ground, then we'll be very very happy. And the other um, one I've written is a, a series called Cooper after my lad, uh, who doesn't like going to school. And uh, his granddad passes away, he's Spanish, based on my family. And uh, he gives him a tin with three marbles and their wishes. So he makes the first two wishes, you know, and the third wish, because his dad says, oh, it's the greatest time of your life. And he wishes that his dad could go back in time and go to school. So his dad wakes up in the body of a 14-year-old boy and goes to school, but then realises why his son doesn't like school and, and it all, all folds out. So I've just written those two. And I'm, I just like the process of writing, mm. you know, I, Oh, I've got a nice house and I'll still get up and I'll go to like a Starbucks not far from me and I'll sit and I'll write. And when I've hit a wall, I'll get up and go back home. And when I've just come back from being on a cruise ship doing a gig and I just took the laptop and I just, I'm very, very lucky, Alex. I'm very lucky that I was in the middle of the Pacific having breakfast, just typing away. And it was, it was lovely. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, I get that. I've, I've, I'm, I'm, throwing around ideas in my head about a next book and it's uh it's a great process isn't it and and uh we'll see where it goes but so well good luck with it yeah cheers yeah well the first one's done all right so i'm really pleased and uh and i love writing so we'll see what happens but mike i've loved chatting to you i love talking comedy uh it's my real passion and and uh um do i want man city to win the treble hmm. I, suppose I, I suppose i do <laughs> yeah, but but although I do think it'd be good for Arsenal because it it would be good for the Premier League. But I look forward to uh, coming to uh, the Etihad next year and getting another stuff in because that's 
That seems to be the general thing when you play us, but... You never know, Alex. You never know. As your man says, God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> he does indeed. He does indeed. <laughs> Mike, thanks so much, and uh, God bless you, and thanks for coming on. Pleasure, Alex. Have a lovely day, my friend.